please welcome Chef Ken Polk. Hello, classroom. Hello, everybody. How's everybody today? How's everybody today? Yay! Happy Sunday, happy Sunday, happy Sunday. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. My name is Chef Ken Polk, representing Batter and Berries. Uh, and we're going to have some fun today. Everybody ready to have some fun? Yes, yes. Who all likes food? Obviously, all of us. And so what I'm going to be preparing for you today is one of my childhood favorites. So it's kind of an ode to my parents, who are both from the South. And what we're going to make for you today is a roasted salmon croquette. Uh, yeah, we're going to make a roasted salmon croquette, and we're going to try to pull off two different sauces. Uh, one is more brunchy with a hollandaise, and one is more lunchy or dinner with a, uh, with a roasted pepper aioli. Uh, and the one for brunch, we're going to try to make it into a Benedict, and the other one, we're just going to leave them plain. So how about we get started? So what we have here is a cinder-cut, wild-caught, wild-caught Atlantic uh, salmon filet. Um, and if you're wondering about the differences between the flavors, you will definitely notice the difference of flavor if you use a wild caught. Now, when I was growing up, we didn't have salmon filet. We had two cans of salmon. One was Jack mackerel, and the other one was pink salmon. And so this was my way to upgrade that dish that I ate as a childhood. And oddly enough, uh, when my parents would both make it, uh, depending on whether what time of day we were going to eat it as to how it was prepared. If we were eating it on a Friday night, then it would get deep fried and made, made, made by hand patties. But if my dad made them for Sunday or Saturday morning breakfast, they would get flattened out and we would have those with rice. And so we're gonna have a kind of a hybrid of the two today. So we're gonna start off with our salmon and then what we're gonna basically do is we're gonna put all of our nice seasonings on it. We're gonna get it into the oven and roast. So once that happens, we're gonna put it into the oven and let it roast just until we start to see the albumin come out. We don't want to overcook it because the longer we cook it in the oven, the more stuff we have to add into it so it can stay together. So we're just going to cook it, roast it for about five to seven minutes, take a look at it, and if it needs to go longer than that, then we'll put it back in. So what we have is a little bit of Cajun seasoning, a lot of bit of Cajun seasoning, paprika, smoked paprika it is, cayenne, everybody loves cayenne. and some kosher salt. You do not have to use kosher salt, but if you don't use kosher, I would suggest you use sea salt. Why? Because it's fish. Fish, sea salt, makes sense. All right, all right, all right. I'm actually gonna do both sides of it. All right, all right, all right. Get that flip back over. Then we're gonna brush it with some clarified butter. Butter is better. If you choose not to use butter, that's your own choice. Find something flavorful, whatever you like. You can use whatever you like. All right, and into the oven, we're gonna let that roast. Nice. All right, so that's gonna be in there for about seven to eight minutes, and then we're gonna check it. Um, it should be nicely caramelized on the outside, and it should just be flake tender. You should just see it flake. If it goes past the flake stage, that means you're going a little bit too far. And then we're gonna let it cool down before we get to using it. Now I get to have some fun for myself. I get to cut some things. Yay. Some nice peppers are gonna go on the inside. Beautiful knife, isn't it? This is a shun knife. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut, we're gonna cut our peppers down into a small dice. The smaller, the, the smaller that they are, the more equally you know, they'll incorporate into our dish. So that's what we're gonna do. Beautiful thing about this dish is you can have them at night, you can have them in the morning, you can have them for breakfast, lunch, brunch, dinner, whenever you want to eat them, they'll be good to go. While I'm doing this, Tay is going to get us some lemon zest. 
Oh, nice color, nice color on that, isn't it? They must have knew I was coming. Uh, I need just enough lemon zest to put in my, to put in my salmon. So you can go ahead and zest the whole thing because I may use it later. When we cut peppers, we want to try to cut them with the skin side down. So I used to tell all my students. Speaking of which, I have one in the audience. Hi, Miles. Knife skills are essential. And I love this, I love this booze block that they gave us. So what's gonna happen is now we're gonna sweat these vegetables off. What we mean by sweat is we're just gonna slightly, we're gonna slightly cook them in a saute pan uh, on low to medium heat. And I'm gonna use a tad bit of cl our same clarified butter. Why is that? Butter is better. So we just want them to sweat. Uh, if I had onions, onions would go in first. Uh, we just want them to sweat a little bit until they start to, till you can start to smell them. Uh, if it was scratch or sniff, otherwise I'd pass it around so you all can smell it. One of the, one of the best things I can tell you about cooking, and a lot of people have been asking me for years, how do I get better at cooking? Uh, and if, and if, if they're always messing things up, one of the best things you can understand about cooking is when to stop. Uh, because if you go too far, you can never bring it back. You can always cook more, but you can never uncook what you've already done. Does that make sense? All right. Beautiful little chives we have here. I'm gonna switch knives. This knife has been with me for a while. It's called Mac Daddy. Yes, I named my knives. My knives are my best friends in my kitchen, so I talk to them and they talk back. No, I'm not just, not a little crazy. Wonderful. Uh, they're just starting to sizzle. Let's toss these. They're just starting to sizzle now. Once they just start to sizzle, can you guys hear that? That's just about all we want. We do not want them to get any more color on them than they already have. And that's it. That's it. So this is just gonna go right into the fridge to cool off. All right, all right, all right. Guess what time it is? It's sauce time. Can you go ahead and uh, puree the go ahead and puree the uh, the breadcrumbs that we're gonna put in? Yes, with the new the new model KitchenAid mixer, no more twisty turny. You just put it on and it and it goes. That should be plenty. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. So the first sauce we're gonna attempt. A little bit more. Excellent. I'm gonna turn this down. That's it. So the first sauce we're gonna attempt is a hollandaise. Very classic sauce. Bachelor. All right, keep it moving. Bless you. Red wine vinegar. I'm going to need this for the lemon juice.
Have you been counting? It's not been seven. So it's not been seven minutes. But hey. All right. Give that a little whisk. So the two sauces we have are very, very similar. So we're going to whisk, whisk, whisk this until it starts to form nice little ribbons. This is a very old school method. I remember when I worked at the Ritz-Carlton, we used to have to make a big bowl of it every morning and then every afternoon. And some people have a question as to how much, how much egg yolk will hold or how much hollandaise you can make with how much butter you have. As a general rule, uh, it is believed that one egg can hold about eight ounces of water, um, eight ounces of egg uh, clarified butter. And so if you wanted to go the aioli route, aioli is very similar to a mayonnaise. So instead of using clarified butter, you use oil, vegetable oil, olive oil, pickle oil, avocado oil. Today you'll be using, well, the healthy nuts today will be using, do you know? Coconut oil. Coconut oil. I happen to have an aversion to coconuts. Stemming from my childhood. I'm gonna tell a story that my mother's never heard. Having a version of coconuts because when my father, one of my father's birthdays, he had a coconut cake. And I decided I want some of this coconut cake. I wasn't supposed to have any of this coconut cake. So I took a piece of the coconut cake. And what do you know happens when I took the piece of the coconut cake? Anybody want to guess? Somebody came in the room. And so I tried to swallow the coconut cake as fast as possible. It didn't work. <laughs> And so now, whenever I get coconut near my mouth, I gag and I can't, I can't do coconut. Lessons learned, right? I told you she's never heard it. But you know what today is, right? She's going to learn today. No, no, no. What I need for this is to get wet so I can have another hand. No, just, I just need this wet, just a wet towel. Quick tip. You only got two hands, so how do you keep the bowl stable? A wet towel is like a third hand if you're trying to keep a bowl stable. So you just basically, basically make a little, make yourself a little, a little bowl nest, and then you can easily, thank you so very much, bless you. Ta-da. In case you've never seen that little magic trick, now you have. Salmon check. Beautiful. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch sides. You finish this and I want to show them the progression on the salmon. Got it? So I got to show you guys this, because it's beautiful. All right, so if you have a center cut salmon, you can actually take a look at it. You can actually take a look at it, and you can start to see, you can start to see the white come out of it. Can you all see that? That's called albumin. Can you all say that? Albumin, AKA, this is the same protein that you find in egg whites. Once you see that start to come out, that's a good indicator that your salmon is about what? Done. Not just your salmon, but any fish. Any fish that flakes, that's a good indicator about when it's done. If you want your fish to be nice, tender, and juicy, and retain its moisture, that's about how far you need to cook it. All right, and it'll carry over cooking the rest of the way. Does that make sense? So, what do I mean by carry over cook? Carry over cook means once I take this out of the oven, it's still going to be hot. Just like if you burn yourself, once you, take your, once you unburn yourself, you, it's still burning for a, uh, for a long period of time. 
So this probably just has another two minutes or so. Probably has another two minutes or so, and then it should be good to go. How are we doing on that sauce, Chef? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. All right, all right, all right. I'm going to add a little bit of lemon zest into that. Looks like you need some hot water. I'm going to borrow a little bit of hot water to thin that out. Just a tad. Keep whisking. I got your back. Excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So this sauce is about done, thank you. I'm gonna finish it up with my seasonings now. Okay. Salt. Somebody got that joke. All right, so hollandaise tricks. If your hollandaise is too, if you're making hollandaise and your hollandaise is too thick for your taste, you can always thin it out with a little bit of hot water. You want it to be hot water, not cold water. Cold water will make it congeal kind of sort of. Hot water would, would incorporate evenly, nice. If you want it, if it's too thin and you want it to thicken up, what you can do is you can add a little bit of lemon juice or some type of acid, whether it be red wine, uh, red wine vinegar, you can even red red wine if you'd like, I'm not gonna judge. All right, so right now, right now it's at a paste level. I want it to get a little bit thinner, so I'm just gonna add a little bit more water. Aqua. Oh, they have some handy dandy water just here for me. Isn't that wonderful? So the consistency that you want is the one that's right. In a restaurant, we have to do a have to do a hollandaise test to make sure that it is thin enough, but it doesn't break. Breaking it is a whole nother class we don't have time to teach today. And there we have a beautiful emulsion. All right, salmon out. Ooh, la la la, sassoon. So now you guys can see what I was talking about in terms of the flakiness of the salmon. See that? See that just, pause, just falls right apart. So that's what we're looking for. It'll continue to carry over right in the refrigerator. Yeah, I was supposed to go to the other side. Chef trick. I only have one refrigerator at home. All right. These are ready. You had the bowl. That's one sauce down. Move all of this out the way. I'll take that bowl now. Thank you. And I'll take my lemon zest. I'll take my peppers, which have cooled down. So the beauty of this is I'm not going to add too many ingredients in. Breadcrumbs. And salmon. All right. Thank you very much. So at the restaurant, we use we use brioche for our uh, for our toast. And so as a just a precautionary binder, I add a few breadcrumbs in, a few breadcrumb flakes. That's all that's required. Thank you. Now, 
I don't know if you all can see this, but this salmon is basically tender enough to flake and pulse by hand. Now, when I was growing up, I, rem I really remember the spoon that they had. It was a three-pronged spoon. You remember that spoon? Three-pronged fork, rather, should I say. So in we go with that. Now, FYI, this is very, very nicely seasoned already. Put my chives in. So all you want to do is basically see that it is going to bind for you. FYI, another trick. If you did not want to make salmon croquettes, this would make really, really good salad at this point. You could eat this over crackers. If you just got lazy and felt like eating right now, nobody would blame you if you started. If I had some crackers, I'm just saying. So you can call it roasted salmon salad at this point. Put that over some toast with a little bit of your hollandaise, and you're good. So, spoon, not yet. Probably gonna need a few more breadcrumbs. All right, so how do you know when you're ready? Look at that, look at how beautiful it is. Can you guys still see the flakiness of how flaky this salmon is? So what you basically want to see is if it will hold itself together. Will it hold itself together? I think so. All right? So that tells me that we can pro I'm just going to add a tad bit more, just for argument's sake. Nice big flakes. Flaky, flaky, flaky. Now, to finish these, there are several options you can go with. You can leave them naked, meaning not add any coating to the outside of them. You can coat them with cornmeal. You can coat them with breadcrumbs. You can coat them with panko breadcrumbs. You can saute them if you'd like. You can deep fry them, they'll hold together. You can pan fry them, which is what we're gonna do. I like this. One, two, three, four. I think I'll get this for home. You see that? All right, all right, all right. I'm gonna make them and put them on here. Yep, that's what I need. Give this a little taste real quick. Parsley. Thank you so very much. You go back in there. I love these things growing up. Oh, I wish you guys could taste this. So the parsley is gonna add a little bit of freshness to it for us. So we have the parsley in there, we have the lemon in there, the fresh chives. The fresher your ingredients are for this dish, the better it's gonna taste for you. Can you go ahead and start on those egg poachings for me? One and two. So at the restaurant, we, we make a Benedict without bread. Those are beautiful, if I say so myself. 
Check to see if my pan is, pan is warm, hot enough for us. No. They did. Some cooks back there. You know what I want to do? I want to take a few more of those uh, breadcrumbs and I want to do some coated and some uncoated. Post them a little bit more. So the way my brain works, uh, whenever I come up with a dish, I don't come up with one iteration of the dish. I come up with several ways to make the same thing. Uh, because I live in a house with, live in a house with three and a half women. And so I often have to make the same dish different ways to make everybody happy. And the same thing in a restaurant. People come in and they want a particular thing a particular way. That's beautiful. For flavor, I'm going to add a little bit of clarified butter. Thank you. They're going right in that bowl that, you just, that I just gave you. Right in that bowl. Yep. And olive oil. Don't cry over spilled milk. Or spilled breadcrumbs either. All right. You guys hear that? Yeah. As a chef in the kitchen, that's one of the ways we can tell when stuff is going right and when stuff is not going right. We can hear it. Make a few more. Now keep in mind, I didn't have to add any egg to this. because the, the albumin itself is going to hold it together. Thanks, chef. So these we're just going to lightly coat. We certainly didn't have brioche when I was growing up. Not in my house. We had two choices. Actually, it was three. White wheat or cornbread. <laughs> and it wasn't jiffy. Beautiful. Plates. Here they are. Time check. Need a napkin. Beautifully crispy. I wish you guys could see this down there. Can you see it? I can't see what you see. You want to eat it? No problem. I got you in a few minutes. So that's that. Hit that with a little bit more hot water so it can, it's gotten cold on us. It's chilly out here.
All right. Perion, this is for you, buddy. And Lottie and Andrew. I could do this all day. I could feed you all if I had more salmon. So this is what they look like when they come out. Beautiful egg. We should taste it. What do you think? I think so. You think so too? Oh, yeah. Can they taste? Uh, You're supposed to say no. <laughs> Hi, Felicia. Did we get it? Is that money? We can sell that? All right. Not mine. <laughs> there will be no smacking of the mothers today. <laughs> All right. Give me a poached egg now. Where? May I have another? Switch. Before I get carried away. Beautiful. Not yet. Spoon. You can have that. Zest. I think I want a few more chives for this one. Let's get to work on some aioli. You have another small bowl? Yes, you do. In terms of garnishment, I was always taught that if it's not in a dish, don't put it on the plate. The reason why I'm using chives is because it's in there. So that is our first one. Yay! So now we're gonna play with a little bit of aioli. So, ooh, I get to use a knife. This one was made for that. So I have some roasted garlic here. If you don't know how to roast garlic, there are, there are tons of ways to do it. One quick way to do it, is, and you can do it and forget about it, is you can take a whole clove of garlic, a whole bulb of garlic, slice the top off, put a little bit of olive oil in it, throw it in the oven 350, about 15 or so minutes, check it. you should be able to smell the garlic roasting. That's method number one. Number two is you can take garlic that is out of the clove and you can put that into, you can put that into some aluminum foil, make a little pouch out of aluminum foil, put some olive oil in it, put that into the oven and let it roast. That's gonna take about 45 or so minutes. Another way is you can take a pot of oil, put it on the stove, put some garlic cloves in that pot of oil, and let it come to uh, just until the oil looks like it's about to bubble, like it's about to fry, turn it off, and then the garlic will roast in there, and then you'll end up with garlic and roasted garlic oil. 
kind of cool, huh? You can use that or as long as you choose to use it. Uh, but so our aioli uh, is basically we're going to do a cheat away. We're going to take some mayonnaise that's already been made, and we're going to mix it with our roasted garlic. Otherwise, you make you can make mayonnaise from scratch. Do I have enough time to show them that? Yes. Yes, chef, you do. All right. He is. Yes, <laughs> he is teaching. All right, all right, all right. So here's where the fun part comes in. Uh, I had some saffron here that I was going to turn. I have another little pot? Nope, I can use this one. Water. So what I need to do is I need to get this saffron to steep. I love saffron. You ever heard that phrase, you got caught red-handed? I got caught white-handed, but nevertheless. <laughs> so what's gonna happen is this. this. You put the saffron threads in some water and they're basically gonna turn the water to gold. Uh, when, they used to, when they used to have to pick, well they still do have to pick them all by hand. There we go. If you pick saffron or you handle saffron, you'll end up with gold fingers. Not like the movie, but you'll end up with gold fingers. And so if people would steal saffron, they would, you know, would find you were stealing it because you would have red hands. Can you do me a favor? Can you go ahead and chop this roasted red pepper up for us? Thank you so very much. Chop it as fine as you possibly can. You can even use my knife if you like. Here you are. Winkers. So great, that's that. And our water is already turned. I'm gonna put it in this handy dandy dish so you all can see it. Ooh, I'm an alchemist. <laughs> you can leave that on. All right, so what I'm gonna basically do is pour this in. Oh, I can smell that. You can smell it. Has anybody ever smelled saffron before? I can't have a volunteer. Can we just pass this around so that they can smell it? So saffron is the most expensive spice on the planet. And if you've never seen it, you've never smelled it, that's what it smells like. It looks like a pistol from a flower, because that's exactly what it is. Um, and it's, it's my favorite, one of my, well, it's my favorite spice to use, one of my favorite spices to use. And in they go. Yep. Oh, you like my knife, huh? All right, that's good. So what I'm gonna do is allow, I'm gonna allow that to steep down and get down a little bit more. We have a salad. Guess where these little boys are going? In the salad. Salt. I didn't give you all my saffron. I kept some for myself. Oh, it smells so good. You can wipe that. Clean. I'm gonna see if it needs lemon in a second. Wonderful. 
still a little bit of that. Aioli it is. Simple vinaigrette, no muss, no fuss. One. Thanks, Tay. Funny story. I asked someone how to make a vinaigrette and what the ingredients were. And they said vinegar and et. <laughs> Needless to say, he didn't get the job. <laughs> vinegar and et, okay, you're original. Original funny guy. So, vinaigrettes can range, range in flavors based on the acidity level that you desire. This is a simple one-to-one, -one, equal parts of vinegar and acid. The acid that I'm using today, obviously, is lemon juice. Want to get that toss for us, please? Yes. Bless you. A little bit of chives in there. We're going to have a little side salad to go with our go with our cakes. Make sure I get some of those nice roasties in there. Bada bing, bada bam. Do we have any questions? Any questions for the chef? Questions about We're, salmon, questions about right life? Chef. Yes, ma'am. Hold on. The salmon is roasting. OK, so know your oven. Uh, when you roast something, you want them to be roasting at a high temperature. 325, you're not roasting anything. 375, 425, I mean, well, somewhere between 375 and 425 is where you are. If you have a convection oven, I would go on the lower end because you have the fan blowing. Uh, if you have a conventional oven, I would go on the higher end. Does that make sense? Uh, you saw just until it flakes, right? Or just until you, the, when you see the album come out, you're good to go. And then it flakes, you're really good to go. And let it rest. And yes, ma'am. Oh, is there somebody over here? Go. Yes, ma'am. I, want, I wanted to know about poaching, your, poaching the eggs. Is there yes, like a technique to that? Because it never works out for me. OK, so tell me what happens when you do it. Um, they kind of break apart, or they're, they're just, they don't stay together. OK, I mean, they are fresh do, you put eggs. Any, do you put any acid in the water? I was wondering about that, yes. Acid in the water helps, helps the protein coagulate. OK. All right, acid in the water helps the protein coagulate. What, what does the water look like when you put it in? It just becomes really, really cloudy. No, no, no. Before you put it in, what does the water look like? Oh, it's boiling. That's your problem. Turn it down. Poaching liquid is about 190 degrees. Boiling is a 212 degrees. Okay. Boiling is a rapid convection. Poaching is not ra rapid convection. Okay. It should look like this. Come up. Come look. And I'm actually going to turn this back on. All right, so what you should see, I'm going to move this over here. What you should see, you should see little bubbles around the outside of the rim. Mm -hmm. If you see more, if you see big bubbles moving, you've gone too far. Okay. Turn around, <laughs> go back. So how much acid do you need to put in a pot of water? You, if, it, if, if you're doing a pot like this, I will half a lemon. Half a lemon or a, table or a teaspoon of uh, vinegar, whatever, whatever vinegar you choose to use but they should go in 
Um, uh, as long as they're covered, they'll be fine, and then they come out. Depends on how done you want them to be. But if your water's boiling, it's not gonna poach. It's gonna boil and break apart immediately. And then what you take it out with, the spoon, the spoon, the spoon should look like this. It shouldn't be too big. Wooden spoon won't work because <laughs> it'll run away from the wooden spoon. All right, glad we could help. And yes, ma'am. Um, when did you start getting into cooking? When did I start getting into cooking? Funny story, my father was a mechanic. He owned an auto shop. Well, he, uh, he owned a mechanic shop and he would employ a bunch of people from the neighborhood and wherever they came from. And so I got into cooking by making them lunch. So I'll make them bologna sandwiches. Anybody remember bologna sandwiches? <laughs> bologna sandwiches where you put it in the skillet and it will bubble up with the, with the, with the uh, good cheese on the top, the good cheese from the 80s. <laughs> Somebody knows what I'm talking about. So that's how I got started. So I would make the sandwiches, I would make the lunches, and it got to the point where they didn't want anybody else making their lunches. So that became my job. I didn't really want to be a cook, but it kind of, kind of fell on me. And so then I actually wanted to be don't tell anybody, I want to be a race car driver. But cooking was my path, I mean, cooking was what I was good at, people liked it, uh, and so then I found out that I was good at it. And so then I went to culinary school. Somebody say, which one? All of them. <laughs> I went to every culinary school in Chicago, I also went to Le Cordon Bleu in London, uh, Johnson & Wales, Le Cordon Bleu here, Kendall College took classes at, um, Washburn, French Pastry School, all of them. Why, why so many classes? Because I also taught culinary. So it was, you know, I needed to know where they were gonna go. So I, the best way for me to tell a student where to go is to go be a student myself, if that makes any sense. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah. Restaurant at? 2748 North Lincoln Avenue. We're open seven days a week, twice on Sunday. Yes, <laughs> Batter and Berries is, my, is the name of the restaurant. Batter and Berries. Yes, and so this was just on our menu. Right now I have the similar, so a very similar preparation, but it's a crab and crawfish cake. It's a crab and crawfish cake, not a croquette. Uh, yes, any other questions? Surely. I think that's, yeah. Thank you all so very much. Ladies and gentlemen, much. round of applause, Chef Ken Polk. Thank you.